Today on the CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast. Aquatic Informatics is a data analytics company that helps save a village in Malaysia from flooding, monitors the water quality for the world's biggest economy, and provides services as far away as Afghanistan. You know, when you're learning, uh, at times you have to fake it uh, until you make it to to your sweet spot. And by faking it, I think you just got to get in there, try your best, and just basically, you know, jump in in the deep end. Uh, And then later in your career, as you get to this sort of mastery phase, um, the risk there is that turn into boredom. And at that point, you know, we're looking to perhaps resetting people back down onto another curve where they have to start faking it again, at least initially until they learn the skills where they move from just that early learning phase into sort of a sweet spot and again towards for mastery of, of skills. On this episode of the CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast, We learn how CEO Ed Quilty leveraged a foot in the door to build a global success story. Here is Michael Hainsworth. Ed Quilty knows an opportunity when he sees one. And while he never expected to find himself wading into tainted waters in the BC interior or managing a global success story, the founder and CEO of Aquatic Informatics has built a career on reinventing himself. I caught up with the innovation economy entrepreneur from his office in Vancouver. Not a lot of kids growing up want to be CEOs of companies that manage data infrastructure providers. How did you end up in this line of work? Really by accident and probably through uh, some bad luck. Um, So I did my undergrad in biology. I went to the University of Victoria doing a co-op degree. And I had a, uh, a great co-op job came up and I was going to be tracking elk on Vancouver Island, which is kind of the dream job for any biology student that or uh, any sort of marine mammal studies. And I can imagine you got some great photos of the elk. Well, I wish I had, but uh, unfortunately what happened about a week before the work placement, the funding got cancelled. I was left without a job and went back to the co-op office and there's only one job available left. It was in the Kootenays and I was looking at acid mine drainage. Uh, in uh, in Kimberley, there's a, a mine there, and looking at industrial waste, which is not what I wanted to to do at the time, and, and obviously not really any no other students really in the program were interested in that job, uh, so I took it really uh, no choice, and I was uh, you know a week later I was standing on the edge of a, a creek in in Kimberley, BC, and pretty shocked actually at the amount of pollution. Uh, going to this beautiful stream that was totally devoid of life and I was hooked. I really wanted to uh, solve this problem and that led to, you know, kind of a winding path where now I'm the CEO of a a software company focused on the world's water data management challenges. And in between those two things, you left BC's Ministry of the Environment to start your own consulting firm. So what was the biggest lesson you learned going out on your own like that? Yeah, and I think this is where I really uh, identified the market opportunity. So um, I actually really loved my job at, at BC Environment. I worked there for a couple of years, and we were exposed to really diverse environmental uh, challenges. And uh, when I did leave to start my own consulting company, I wanted to narrow in on one uh, particular one part of uh, the work we'd focused on at uh, the Ministry of Environment, and that was looking at the impacts of forest harvesting on rivers in British Columbia. And from there, we started installing sensors in rivers to try and monitor continuously what the impacts are rather than taking a sample every once in a while. Because that was the big advance at the time. Yeah, this was sort of the disruption in the market. Before then, you'd go out once a month or once a season and collect some observations. And now we're putting a sensor in the river. Um, You know, it's sort of the equivalent of comparing a, a movie to a snapshot or a Polaroid. I gained so much more information. Really, for me, realized uh, you know this was a great way to collect a bunch of information, but there weren't really tools to manage the sheer volume of information coming in, and that was where sort of lightning struck for me and led me to go build a platform to manage that type of data. So we could only go back and uh, try and understand what were uh, the challenges in the rivers at the time and what was causing them. But it sounds like there was a remarkable volume of data coming out of those sensors, but data that sort of overwhelmed your skill set, leading you to go back to grad school specifically to expand it. That's exactly right. So, you know, my undergrad was in biology 
And really, uh, a nice data set at the, time, at the time might be 30 or 40 samples. It would actually be considered a big data set where you could get, uh, do some analysis and be able to determine with statistical significance you know, what the trends might be. Now I'm getting that every 30 seconds and getting millions and millions of uh, measurements per year. And I didn't have the skill set um, at the time. We weren't, uh, weren't taught how to process that kind of information in biology. So I went back to grad school to really take courses and work in other departments where they did manage that type of data, electroengineering and geophysics. And so you're quoted as saying that you met for a full day, once a month for three years with the CEOs of a business training program in Vancouver. And 10 years later, you were still meeting monthly with that original group. Do you still keep in touch? Absolutely, we still meet every month. Um, and that was really, you know, the transition from a biologist to a data scientist to an entrepreneur and CEO. That was uh, really valuable having that cohort of other entrepreneurs that we could uh, grow together and share best practices, learning from one another. I guess there's an element of a, of a birds of a feather sort of thing as well. You want to steep yourself in a culture of entrepreneurialism to pick up as much as you possibly can. You know, it's often seen when you're an entrepreneur, it can be a pretty uh, lonely world or isolating. You tend to stand alone a lot. Uh, you're making decisions on your own initially until your company gets more to scale and you surround yourselves you know, with a really strong team. But yeah, we had joked in the early days and I think actually still do that we were, um, our group was sort of like AA where we would get together and uh, you know, share our challenges and support each other uh, getting through the, uh, the wild but you know, still fun ride of, uh, of being an entrepreneur. So then what is your advice to that entrepreneur just starting up dealing with that insane loneliness that comes with being a, a one-man shop on day one? You know, really, my uh, the same way I applied, um, you know, sort of the concept of continuous learning uh, when I face a challenge, uh, you know, in the field with uh, a lot of information coming in, I went back to university to try and uh, learn new skills. It can be a little bit more tricky on the entrepreneurial world. So I looked for places where I could develop these skills. And, you know, really the, the first obvious step for me was this local group of entrepreneurs who are going through similar challenges and we're bringing in experts from around the world uh, to provide some um, training and mentorship. So, you know, reaching out, not being afraid to ask for help, not pretending you have all the answers. I think really be thirsty for, for learning is really the central requirement uh, of being an entrepreneur. I was reading an old article uh, about you that stated that in 2014, you were up to 100 staffers and you doubled your revenue year over year. Where are you now? We're back into rapid growth mode. Uh, two years ago, we did a deal with a private equity firm out of Toronto, XPB Water Partners. They were really appealing to us as they uh, were focused on the water uh, market, understood it well, understood the challenges and the opportunities. Um, and they provided a lot of strategic value. And so we did a deal with them to get some uh, growth equity in the, com in the company. We acquired a few companies uh, since that time. So we've grown quite rapidly. And uh, we're now back into hiring mode. Uh, we um, need to hire about 20 new staff, and we'll be continuing that pace for at least the, la the next year. I'm looking at Glassdoor, and it rates aquatic informatics a remarkable 4.2 out of 5 stars. So I'm looking at the cons. It says relatively small company, but the pros, great senior software developers to learn and get coaching from, and awesome coworkers, great views from the office which I'm looking forward to seeing, by the way, and approachable management. How did you incorporate mentoring into the corporate culture like this? You know, there's a number of things that differentiate us uh, in the Vancouver market where our headquarters are and uh, where our other offices are in Denver and in Hobart, Australia, and in Florida. We've got a very uh, open culture where it's uh, total open books, high transparency, we talk about our financials every month. We sh share uh, goals. In fact, this week right now, um, we've got Super Week going on, which is where our entire company comes together 
and uh, shares in planning for the next quarter and a rolling 18 months. And so what we've done up, what we've done is uh, set up a culture of openness, transparency, and coaching, helping each other. And that's been really effective. We've really been growing our uh, team into leaders, providing a lot of leadership, mentoring, and pathways for growth and promotion. And I think we've provided a really clear vision for our team, which is also important. People are driven, uh, motivated by a number of you know different things. It's, it's a little bit up to the individual, but typically mission is really important, clarity of what we're working on and how they're being measured and how they can contribute. And I think the transparency has really helped with that. And, um, and we've really, um, you know, embraced, again, continuous learning to, uh, to provide tools and skills for our team uh, to become better leaders. Are these the kinds of things that come with being in your stage of the company's uh, growth trajectory, or is it something you can apply on day one as well? Because it seems to me that in the early days of entrepreneurship, you're just so focused on getting a minimal viable product out the door, bringing in financing, that the 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 cuddly, uh, feely type stuff that comes with bringing the entire staff in to discuss the future and on a quarterly basis, no less, um, sounds like something that would take up an awful lot of time in those early days. Or, or, or am I just wrong about this? Is this something that you have to do from day one? Well, let me put it this way. If I was going to start another company, go into startup mode, I would definitely do it the way we're doing right now. You know, you're really looking for a multiplier effect. I think the common uh, mistake that many entrepreneurs make and I myself have made is trying to do everything yourself uh, and holding on too tightly. And you end up getting in the way of your company. You end up being the bottleneck. Yeah, definitely if I was starting a company right now, I'd have open books, be a very transparent culture and you know, growing the rest of your team so you get this multiplier effect. So rather than providing fish to your team, you're training them how to fish and they can go forth and grow their team members. So that's how you scale quickly. Otherwise, it's just too slow and too painful. I've been told that when it comes to hiring, you like to use the beer test. That is true. Uh, there's many benefits to the beer test. Really what it is, is uh, getting to know the person. Um, you know, we're, we are a technology company, but we're actually uh, a people company. It's the people that um, uh, you know, work on the technology, help with our strategy and, uh, and help uh, drive growth in the company. So I find in interviews, people can be nervous. They can uh, maybe not show their best side or they can maybe fake it till they make it uh, approach. So uh, I find the beer test is a, is a good way, um, you know, to really go out in a more casual setting and just have a good chat. And uh, I, I typically find I learn a lot more uh, about the people in a, a one hour you know, beer uh, than I do over multiple rounds of interviews. What do you make of that fake it till you make it idea? Uh, I think it depends on the, the, you know, the situation. Often I think, you know, in our careers, it's good to reset at times. Like you'll, you'll go through this growth curve or S curve of learning and then getting into a sweet spot of knowledge and then into a mastery. And I think, you know, when you're learning, uh, at times you have to fake it, uh, until you make it to the, to your sweet spot. And by faking it, I think you just got to get in there, try your best and just basically, you know, jump in, in the deep end. Uh, and then later in your career, as you get to this sort of mastery phase, um, the risk there is that can turn into boredom. And at that point, you know, we're looking to perhaps resetting people back down onto another curve where they have to start faking it again, at least initially until they learn the skills where they move from just that early learning phase into sort of a sweet spot and again towards for mastery of, of skills. So, you know, um, in our company, we'll have people move from team to team. Um, and sometimes that, it's, you know, seems like you're moving from the top uh, rung on one ladder down to the bottom of another, but it's usually uh, in reality, a big step forward in your own personal growth and professional growth. You've advised entrepreneurs to hire thoroughbreds and that you learned early not to be afraid to hire the best people and pay for it. How do you do that, though, in a startup environment where the money is tight and everyone has to wear multiple hats? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So our approach in early days is we had an employee stock option plan. So uh, you're right, we were very tight on money. In fact, we didn't have any money. I remember having uh, very long conversations on when we'd be able to afford uh, a printer for the office. Uh, you know, three hundred dollars seemed just you know uh, not in the realm of possibility when we started up. Um, and then at the same time, you're trying to uh, acquire great people. So. Um, what we ended up doing is uh, rolling out an employee share option plan where um, we would uh, provide some salary and in the early days a higher portion of, uh, of stock options in the company. And so, you know, that draws uh, a certain type of individual um, to the company. Not everybody can come in on a lower salary. Uh, with this, you know, more risky upside, um, but some people are really drawn to that, and uh, those can be entrepreneurial type people. They're willing to take uh, risks and bets, and in the early days, um, those are very useful people in the company. Of course, as the company matures, um, you start phasing that out where you start paying fair market value for staff and find other ways to uh, motivate them. So let's rewind the clock a little bit to 2013 when you won that $8 million contract with U.S. Geological Survey. What did you learn about the need to staff up uh, to be able to meet those demands? I think at that time, we had to grow from about 40 people to 80 people in a very short period of time. And for perspective, how many do you have now? Uh, we're at about 120 and expecting to grow uh, to about 150 in the next uh, three or four months. All right, so U.S. Geological Survey. Yeah, so, I mean, this seemed like, uh, and it really was, uh, a giant mountain in front of us. It felt like our Everest, uh, though I say, it, I think it's a Himalayan uh, saying that the mountain in front of you is the largest, and you get to the top of that one. And there's another <laughs> big one after that, and that has been our experience. But at the time, it seemed almost insurmountable uh, to, you know, that quickly double our staff and to take on this massive project very exciting but um you know challenging and so uh yeah where do you start we had to focus on really focus on bringing in great people the first place we went was referrals so with our team get them to leverage their networks tell their friends to join our company tell them why our mission is so important um tell them why they love working at our company and that uh, was where we got the majority of our candidates out networking as well, meeting uh, new people at uh, software development meetups and industry events. Um, that was really good. We also had open houses where we'd have open up our office to let people come by and learn about our company and our space and our culture. And we actually, we pulled it off. We were able to hit our hiring goals. And like I said, we're now facing this again where um, you know, we're expecting to hire um, you know, there's a 40 people in the balance this year and probably continue with that track for some time. What's the hardest part about expanding globally and how did you overcome it? You know, certainly there are cultural and uh, business differences in, in uh, some of the markets we've uh, gone to, you know, for example, we're in places like Sudan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, uh, we're in Vietnam, um, Malaysia, um, and those places are a little bit different uh, to do business. And then we're in other places that aren't so different, like Australia, New Zealand, the UK. But really, you know, it was interesting. I looked back and said, you know, you know, a lot of people question, why are you guys in 60 countries when you've got this big market here on the doorstep of, you know, the United States? It's a really good question. But when I was mapped out our, our, the, the countries that we expand to in the early days, they're really tied to between my undergrad and university and uh, grad school days. I went on a trip, uh, actually a number of trips, but the first one um, uh, around the world. And a realization I had on the road is that doesn't matter where you land, people are people. They're generally very friendly, easy to get along to, and the cultures can be quite different, the religions, language, but that made expanding to those markets uh, a little less intimidating. So when we were standing in the early days, I literally would get on planes, land in the country, and just start networking, uh, making calls, emails, 
knocking on doors and that's just how we got going so you know the, you know admittedly there wasn't that much strategy put into it i just thought these would be exciting places to work and it fit with our mission massive water problems um around the world and uh, i really felt you know our mission wasn't tied just to the u.s it was much bigger than that did it help that you started with English-speaking foreign markets before moving into Asia and Latin America? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The The first place uh, you know we went to was uh, Australia. That was a place I had traveled to uh, in my youth, was quite familiar with it. And culturally, Australia, and in particular New Zealand, are much more similar. Uh, you know, the uh, language is obviously the same, slightly different accents, of course, but um, <laughs> You know, it, it was a much easier place to uh, to start. So then how did you overcome the cultural differences when you did get into Asia and Latin America? Yeah, one of the keys for us is find the right partners. In some countries, we did go uh, at it alone, but we typically tried to find a great partner um, that, uh, you know, worked in that market. Um, you know, so it was kind of a bridge to that culture. We had someone that had maybe one foot in both cultures, and we used that bridge. Uh, initially to get in there. So the company was founded back in 2003. So clearly past the startup stage, you mentioned you're you know, back into the growth stage. But I was also told that it's kind of a matter of outlook, not financials, as to whether you consider yourself you know, a 10-year-old startup or a two-year-old startup or a 10-year-old growth stage company or a two-year-old growth stage company. How do you describe the where you are right now? Yeah, we're back into uh, growth, but that's as I'd say sustainable, profitable growth uh, versus in the early days. And we've been through lots of cycles. It's been around, you know, uh, 17 years now, uh, or almost 17 years. Um, you know, we've gone through all of those stages, all of those cycles, and we're in a diff bit of a different phase right now. We're very stable as a company. We've got um, you know strong revenues. We've got uh, a lot of customers, nearly two thousand customers. So in one sense, we're very stable, um, and we're in a market that is very conservative and slow moving, and stable. And so it can be hard to grow quickly in a market like that. And also, when you've come out of many years of uh, um, you know kind of the excitement and stress of high growth and you know successes and failures along the way um you know there's perhaps a temptation to go a little slower once you're in this uh more stable position but we're really excited by our mission um solving these problems uh worldwide uh we we really feel to accomplish our mission we have to grow much more quickly um uh, solve more problems in the water space in more geography so um, yeah, we're back into rapid growth mode, but it feels different this time. Uh, we've got you know great financials, lots of customers. It's not a uh, high growth startup. It's a high growth, more mature company. Tell me about those financials. You mentioned you've already received investor cash injections. CIBC provided you with a debt facility. Why was that the best solution? Part of our growth strategy is to do acquisitions. So really, our, we've got four brands now under the Aquatic Informatics um, you know, company, and uh, each one um, and its own, on its own uh, is, is very strong and is having nice um, organic growth at a, at a really good clip. But on top of that, uh, we wanted to acquire companies and have and will continue to acquire companies. So um, that's done through a, a, you know, a, a mix of options and one of them does include using debt, which we've got through CIBC, a nice uh, debt facility to help us grow. And we're using it mostly to acquire companies. And I guess the idea is that you're not giving away a piece of your company to acquire those other companies. That's exactly it. So we are buying, buying companies that are smaller but are quite profitable and um, we go in and, and grow them uh, more rapidly and maintain the profitability and through a debt facility, it provides a pretty good option as non, you know, we're not diluted. And um, as far as our, our uh, ownership uh, and we can bring in these companies and pay off the debt uh, in a few years from the profits from those companies. 
Tell me about that that financial calisthenics you have to go through because you have to weigh the the rate at which you would be repaying any debt versus the growth rate and the revenue, the cash flow coming in from that new acquisition. Yeah, that's right. So again, we do have a number of options. We can use our own profits from operations to acquire a company. We can use debt. And we can also use uh, equity. We do have um, you know, an equity firm, a private equity firm, uh, backing us. So we really have uh, a number of options. Um, and then when deciding which one to do, you're exactly right. We look at the financials of the companies. Uh, we're acquiring some are uh, a very good uh, fit for debt. Like I said, if they're profitable um, and sort of bankable, really good fit for uh, debt. If they're more startup, um, little revenue, um, more of a bet, that's more of a fit for uh, equity. Um, and uh, so we really do model out the acquisitions, what the, what we expect they'll do over the next five years, run a, a number of different scenarios. And from that, we can decide what's the best mechanism. So other than a debt facility, what has CIBC done for you? I think within the first week, we acquired uh, our first company with it. So yeah, we're off to a very good start. They've been very supportive, you know, through the initial transaction. We felt them, uh, they were really great to deal with um, and looking at our options for the bank we wanted to partner with. And really, it really is a partnership. We're working with them, uh, you know, they'll review the deals, um, you know, in the later stages. Uh, if we're going to use the debt facility. So, you know, it is early days, but so far, I mean, we've been dealing with a number of banks for, you know, nearly 20 years, and it's been a really great relationship. And I think the relationship is an important part. Uh, the individuals we're working at, uh, working with, uh, they know our businesses quite well. A lot of discussions, we've been sharing our strategy, of course, financial information, and, and them meeting our team. So we, we got very comfortable with each other, and I think we look at it as, as, as really a partnership. So let's extend your Himalayan metaphor. What's the next mountain in front of you? Yeah, so right now it's feeling this rapid growth in a very competitive marketplace uh, for talent, having to hire 40 or so staff, get them on board really quick. That's the, the mountain in front of us. Learn more about the innovation economy, how letting go of two thirds of your clients can pivot your startup for greater success how to retain that entrepreneurial spirit in the face of growing headcount, and why your business model doesn't have to follow Silicon Valley's rules. Subscribe to the CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast with Michael Hainsworth at cibc.com slash innovation banking.